This is GabNet, the Great American Broadcast Network, now in its eighth year of talk like you've never heard it before. Hey everybody, I'm Alex and this is The Ramble and we go until midnight tonight from New York, New York, the city so nice they named it twice. Ladies and gentlemen, oh he just put his hat on, just put his hat on, because you want to make me your your pork pie hat, right? My pork pie hat, because I know how much you like it. Why, why is it called pork pie? I mean, what? I have no idea. If I make a chicken pie, (laughs) right? And then I say to you, see that pie over there with the crust over it? That's a pork pie. You wouldn't know that it wasn't. So, what makes a pork pie hat a pork pie? What is it about? I think it's a short brim. Mm -hmm. When the brim is up all the way around. Yeah. I love the short brim on a hat. Right. I don't like the big brim. No. Somebody bought me a hat, and I it had a big. I got the one with the shortest brim possible, but I couldn't get them short enough. You know. Right. I just like them so that yeah, that that's that's snazzy. <laughs> so anyway, Stephen Kravitz lives in Massachusetts, and he works at. Uh, he's a comedian who does his stand-up comedy at Lowe's. (laughs) Have you been been doing stuff lately? You been working? No. No? I mean, I've just been working at Lowe's. Really? There's not much going on. There was a club here that opened up and it closed before I even had a chance to go down there. Really? The Comedy Attic. Huh. Opened and closed in like a week. Was it on the top floor of a building? Yes. Oh, okay, so it was a comedy attic. Yes. Because I've known some place to call a comedy attic you walk down to. Right, it's in the basement. It's in the basement. Yeah, so. But they closed? How long were they open? Maybe a month. And did you bother to ask why they suddenly weren't open any longer? No, I just went to their website because I was going to go down there, and it said we're closed. Wow. That's terrible. Yeah. That's terrible, you know? It would be really, oh, God. That's horrible. Well, that was one close by, right? Yeah, right. That was one that, you know, I could drive to in like five minutes. I wonder, are are, are comedy clubs kind of an anachronism now? Yes. You know, I mean... Uh, it used to be you open up a comedy club and it was a it was a license to mint money. Pretty much, yeah. You know, and uh, I, in fact, but you had to book, you had to book A level comics. Yeah, but you know you couldn't, you couldn't book uh, Riff Raff, you couldn't book Hacks. Yeah, but you were an A level comic in San Francisco, yes. and Bubbles was an A level comic in San Francisco. Right. You know, so I mean, but what I'm thinking is what happened? I mean, was was there too much of it? Could that be and people just tired of going to a comedy club? Or did they become too expensive to go to? You know, it used to be I think a little of both and I think it just maybe ran its course. Because I found that good cheap entertain you know, it was good cheap entertainment in the old days. Right. How much would you pay to get in? How much was a drink? You know, it was, you know, and uh, so everybody was opening a comedy club. Right. How many? Everybody. How many were there in the Bay Area? I'm trying to remember, but it was. You can make a living and never leave home. Right. And work every night of the week. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because, I mean, there was, uh, I know there was at least one, there was one in uh, East Bay. Maybe there were a couple, actually, but... Uh, there was Walnut Creek, there was Concord, mm-hmm. there was... Uh, where, where was Tommy uh, Where was Tommy T's? San Leandro. San Leandro. Yeah. yeah. And Tommy T's in Concord. Yeah. And the punchline in Walnut Creek. 
Yeah, and then the punchline in San Francisco and Cobb's in San Francisco and right. uh, uh, the zoo, the, the Holy City Zoo, and uh, the we, other cafe. Other cafe. We had at least four, and then they opened up a uh, improv, I think, in San Francisco. Yes, they did for a for, while. For a while. So I mean, you had in the Tenderloin. Five, yeah, you had five clubs right in San Francisco. Right. And they were packed all the time. Right. And people did it because it was cheap. You know, and I think what happened is it became too expensive. And the comedy became too mediocre. I think the comedy became too mediocre. Yeah, because I know that in San Francisco you had a bunch of people fighting for space. Right. You know, you had a bunch of people all yelling and screaming, look at me how funny I am. Right. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, I, uh, I, 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 it, was, uh, it was amazing. It was just amazing, uh, and uh, but so uh, clubs don't exist that much anymore. And I'm wondering uh, uh, here in New York, God, I think there aren't that many either in New York, either. Is it still the improv? There's, I know, I don't know, I don't think so. Really? I know, and the comic strip. I'm wondering if they're still open. You know, and Caroline's? So, Caroline's is still open. You know, Caroline's is in Times Square, and it is like, you know, it's a, it's a bridge and tunnel comedy club. Where people right, from right, New Jersey, right, right. They want to come in, they want to see comedy. They think of Caroline's. Right. And the major, the major acts play Caroline's. Sure. Uh, and then you have the comic strip. Which I I can't tell you whether it's still open or not. I mean, I could look it up here, you know. And isn't there the Boston Comedy Club in, in in New York? No, I don't think so. There was also what was that club? Oh God, what was it? Uh, oh, I'm trying to remember now. There was another big club here. Well, let me see here. Let me just put in the comic strip. Make. Um. No, come on. Jeez almighty. I'm trying to... Okay. The comic strip. You know something? I can't, I can't get this to come up right. Hold on a second. The comic strip. Hey folks, isn't this good television? <laughs> a comic strip live. That's a is a New York City staple New York comedy club. I guess they're still open. Yeah. Okay. Still open. It's called Comic Strip Live. Um, but I can't remember, you know, anything else. Who's playing there right now? Let's see here. Okay, I'm going to give you these names of these people playing there. And you tell me if you ever heard of them. Uh, this is uh, for Wednesday, the 3rd of August. That would be tonight. Right. August 3rd. Okay, Olga Namer. Who? Olga Namer. No. David Suarez. No. David has out. No. Danielle Nero. No. Now you're a comedian working in this business, right? Right. You still pay right. you still pay attention to the business? Sure. And you never heard of any of those people. Uh, Who's there for the weekend? Uh, let's see here. Weekend Friday is Ken Boyd. JJ Ramirez. Chris Roach. No. You're going to love this one. Suba Agarwal. And finally, rounding out the bill, the famous Mike Britt. Never heard of any of them. And then you wonder why you're not working. Right. Uh, and on Friday, next Friday, it's uh, Ken Boyd, J.J. Ramirez. Oh, no, that was... That was then Saturday, Saturday, okay, that would be your big night, right? Saturday, right. right. Patty Roseboro. Mike Britt again. 
Jason Salmon, Ken Boyd, and J.J. Ramirez. Is this amazing? Who ever heard of these people? And I'm looking, I'm looking at uh, uh, like the 10th uh, and the 11th, and if I said these names, it, you wouldn't know who they were. You know, you would think that there would be at least one. I always hear about famous people playing at the... Oh, that's the comic strip. Okay. All right. That's the comic strip. Okay. Who's at Caroline's? There are Caroline's. Okay. Uh, I bet they have more. I bet they have more. Let's see. Caroline's on Broadway. Okay. Uh... Let me see here. Let me go back here. Let me see here. Uh, Caroline's on Broadway. Home. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Here is, uh, let me see here. Michael Blackson. He's a black comedian with a gap tooth. Oh, is he? Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Funniest show on Broadway with Shal Shalawa Sharp. How about the Breakout Artist Comedy Series with Jay Mandiam? Oh God, none of these people, never heard of any of them. And you would even, you would think of Caroline, there would be more, you know? There would be at least one national headliner. Yeah, nothing, nothing. Sam J, Gary Owen, hear of any of these? No. All right. So what have we said here? There's nobody working we ever heard of. And why aren't you on one of those shows? That's right. Because if you were down here and you went in there and you auditioned, say, at the comedy store, you'd probably beat the pants off of half these guys. Yeah. But the thing is, they're probably politically correct. They're probably clean. They're probably like corporate comics. Well, you're, you've never been a particularly dirty comic, have you? No, no, but my language was colorful. Oh, I see. Well, I think colorful language is still acceptable. Is it? Yeah, yeah. I, I would yeah. imagine. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't below the waist. I mean, I wasn't uh, like uh, a blue comic. I was just a streetwise comic. Okay. But you, so, I mean... I, I I think there's no reason why you shouldn't be, you know, one of these people. Or well, you be my agent. I'll be your agent, okay? Who knows? What Make the, some calls. What the problem is? Yeah. Find out. I you know I mean it, it just amazes me what passes for comedy today. Right. Now maybe I don't know of any of these people because they're up and coming, and if I had paid attention to comedy all along, then I would say, oh, I know who that guy is. Sure, he's very right. funny. You know, he's terrific. Right. I mean, I'm wondering if I would have said the same thing about you if I didn't know about San Francisco comedy. Well. You know. What's a Bubbles? What? What's a Bubbles? Yeah, what's a Bubbles? Who names himself Bubbles? Yeah. So, what was it? What, what was the other? What was the other name he worked under besides Bubbles? I think I was the only name he ever worked under. Really? No, it was. Uh, Did he have another name? I have to ask him. Uh, he would do bits about. Uh, oh man. So what? Bobby would, Bitter. Oh, Bobby, Bobby Bitter. Bitter. Bobby Bitter. Oh yeah. No, that was a uh, that was a bit he would do. Right. And he would suddenly be Bobby Bitter. Right. And Bobby Bitter did nothing but put down jokes. Right. Right? Yeah. Uh, yes, I forgot. Yeah, I forgot Bobby. I'm going to have to ring that up to him. I forgot Bobby Bitter. I'm going to have to see if I can get him for a couple of minutes on this program to resurrect Bobby Bitter. You know. I'm sure you can. Yeah. I mean, I don't. I haven't heard him mention it in years. You know? Has he gone video yet or is he still just audio? Don't even ask, okay? I have two old iPhones here. One of them is like not that old. 
And I told right. him, if you will just get it turned on, I will send it to you. Well, I don't know. A lot of people have offered me their phones. <laughs> you know? And I'm going. So now, what happens with him, this one's really going to get to you. He has uh, this, uh, isn't that a nice view of, out my window? Uh, that's my real view. That's not Photoshopped or anything. Right. That, Anyway, uh, where was I? So I, I asked him. Oh yeah. So I, uh, I it was the phone company got a hold of him and said, "I'm sorry. After a certain date, your phone will work no longer, because we've completely gone to you know 5G or whatever the new right thing is. So we'll send you a a new phone, right? Free." on us and what they're going to send him is a uh, is a is a smartphone like an iPhone something like that okay uh, maybe a Samsung maybe one of those but it's it, a smartphone uh, he goes down to his local phone shop where buys all his phones and has over the years he went they want me to get rid of this and they want to give me a smartphone. Do you have any flip phones left that work now? And they went in the back room and they crawled under a floor somewhere. <laughs> and they find this this flip, flip phone. phone. Old timey flip phone. And he says, I'll take it. And he takes it. He gets it turned on. He won't go to a smartphone. He won't go to a phone that is capable of at least seeing the people who are calling you or doing Zoom like we're doing. Right. You know, it just, it, it doesn't, it, it, it's not in the cards. And at home, you think he's got high-speed internet? No, it's too fast for him. Well, has he got dial-up? Yes. Dial-up doesn't exist. There's no it, way he no, can have dial-up. No, no, he d does have dial-up. He said there are something like, in the Bay Area, I think he said 60,000 people who still have dial-up. Of course, they're all in the projects. Right. You know, you know or there's somewhere where, you know, he, he's got dial-up. Every time he, he gets on, and I say, you get all my emails, he goes, yeah. Every time I sign on, I get, you know, that whole noise. You right, make. I remember that. I, I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. I think he's afraid it will ruin his reputation. You know. It'll ruin his image. It'll ruin his image, yeah. Well, I'm too old to figure out how these things work. And uh, if I get it, I'll fuck it up. Well, you know, that's what life is, is learning how to use things because right. along the way you fuck up using them. Right. You know. But uh, we were talking the last time about companies. You know what the worst thing about these companies is? Like, I, I was saying I couldn't get a hold of anybody. At, there's nobody to get a hold of at, uh, uh, at, at Skype. I got one message to them, but it was just simply that I needed to have a new uh, password. And I had to fill out all this stuff, and they say it will take us 24 hours to read it. They're very slow readers. And, and uh, we'll get back to you. And uh, it, it's just that everything is so hard now, just so difficult to get things done. Right. You know? So, I mean, in a way, Bubbles is right, except that he does live in a city. You know, if he became the Unabomber, went up and found a shack up in the mountains somewhere <laughs> and completely extricated himself from society, that would be one thing. If you don't, get a smartphone. You know? Right. I mean, I'm sure you've got a smartphone, right? Yeah, I have an Android. You have an Android. Uh, and that's a smartphone. I'd like to have an iPhone. Yeah. If you want one, I got a couple of them sitting around here. You can have Oh, you do? You want to send me one? Yeah, uh, I'll uh, have to figure out how to send things these days. Uh, but yeah, I, I could send it to you and you just turn it on. You know, right. You just get a hold of your phone company and say, I'm now on this, this other phone. 
How do we right. how do we go about it? How do we do it? But anyway, uh, yeah, I, if I if I can find it, it's yours. You know. Okay. Uh, just send me your send me your address by email. You know how to do email. Okay. You know how to do email, right? Yes, sir. Okay. But anyway, Bubs gets email. I email, I write him just like I write you and say tomorrow, whatever. He writes back. Yup. Because right. that's probably all he can write back because every time, remember the old phones, you had to hit the A button three times to get to the uh, C? A. Yeah. See, he's got a, uh, so he does yup. Well, that takes him probably 20 minutes going. <laughs> and uh, uh, so he does have, he does go onto his computer. You know, and he does do Yeah, why job. can't he? Like, I do this on a computer. Why can't he do this on a computer? Because we couldn't send a picture back and forth like I've got with you with a dial-up. Because the speed isn't fast enough. Oh. It's very... Do you remember dial-up, how slow it was? Sure. You know, you'd go to a page and it would take at least 15 seconds to load. Right, it would, it would load... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So imagine that. That's Bubbles' life. Very slow life for Bubbles. Yeah, what can I say? What can I say? But he's been our friend for years, and we love him dearly. Yes, we do. And if he weren't that way, he wouldn't. If he suddenly got, a, I guess, a, an iPhone, he wouldn't be Bubbles anymore. You know, does that make sense? No, he'd just be bubbles in the 21st century. Oh, God, that's scary. That's scary. Right now, it's still like 1999 with him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, but I got to admit, uh, he, you know, comedy, he's, he works, you know. Oh, yeah. Because he's got a lot of comics, well-known comics, guys like Carvey and David Tell. Who love to use him as an opening act because he's the perfect opening act. Right. He won't spoil the room. No. You know, he's not going to work dirty, so he's not going to, you know, take away from your cachet. Right. And uh, he does his act, and he everybody laughs at him and enjoys it, and he's great, but he's not loud. Right. You know, and then anybody who wants to can follow him. Not oh, because yeah. he be he's bad, but because he's comfortable. Right, he sets a good pace for the room. Yeah, so he's the world's, I think, greatest opening act. And that's all he wants to be. He, he's working. Right. You know, that's the point. Right. Um, you know, a lot of people say, well, don't you ever want to be the, uh, the, and sometimes he is the headliner. Right. But don't you like being an open? He said, he said no, I, I do very well being the opening act for a lot of these very famous comics who the word's gotten around that he's a great opening act for them when they're in right. the Bay Area. And I think Dana Carvey wanted him to open up for him all over the country, but Bubs won't take a plane. Oh, I didn't know that. That's his other great fear. But wait a minute, he, he, he flies gliders. He does, doesn't he? So what's he talking about? He's afraid of airplanes. I don't know. I don't know. But well, he's afraid of airplanes with an engine? Maybe. He just said that to me. With a glider, it's different than getting on an airplane. An airplane you put on in a giant aluminum tube and thrust through, through the air. Right. With a glider, you've got some control over that. Like, he actually flies the gliders, right? Right. I'm going to have to ask him about that, too. Yeah, there's so much I don't know about bubbles. What well, will be revealed to you? Yeah, well, maybe maybe uh, 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 bub there's a lot about bubbles that bubbles doesn't know about bubbles. That could yeah, be true. That could be true. Yeah, she's almighty. Wow, wow, that's terrific. But anyway, it's it just uh, you know these are our friends, folks. These are our friends in comedy. Right. You don't have any, do you have comedy friends up there in uh, in Massachusetts? Not really. Not really. So you're kind Lenny of... Lenny Clark. Lenny Clark is probably the one I know the best. Oh, Lenny Clark's the best. Yeah. There's nobody... 
uh, quickly and then we got to go. You know the story about him and Julia Child, don't you? No. One night he gets really drunk. One night he gets really drunk. Every night he got really drunk. And it's three o'clock in the morning and he's in Harvard Square standing under Julia Child's window yelling at the top of his voice so the whole neighborhood can hear it. Wake up, bitch, and make me breakfast. <laughs> That's my classic Lenny Clark joke. Hey, we've run out of time again. My how time well, flies when you're having a lot of fun. Right. Thank you. I appreciate it once again. Thanks, I, Alex. No end. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Stephen Kravitz, whose birthday is in March, by the way, and he'll be 67. Yeah, by the way. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This is GabNet, the Great American Broadcast Network, now in its eighth year of talk like you've never heard it before. Ah, yes, 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 yes. Okay, there he goes. There's, uh, there's uh, Mr. Kravitz. Uh, he's on his way, and uh, uh, we thank him for having joined us. Uh, we have one person waiting for us. Well, we have two people waiting for us, so uh, maybe we'll just admit them to the uh, citizen panel uh, uh, page here. Here we go. Is it coming up? Wow. Okay, here we go. All right. There they are. There's Alan and there's uh, Jeff. Okay, and that's all we got, folks. So good night. That's it. See you later. <laughs> it's the three Jews. <laughs> Yeah, three yeah, yeah, yeah. three Jews walk into a um, into a um, podcast. Yeah, that's right. Okay, what's the punchline now? That's, that's okay. Okay. you know, you know. That's I looked up. Problem. You were talking with him about Larry Bubbles Brown, and I looked him up, mm -hmm. and something had popped up that I never saw before. His net worth, according to some website, I wrote it down last night. Right, don't tell me. Don't tell me he's worth he, uh, half a million dollars. Oh, five times that. What? Yeah, they claim about five million dollars. I don't know where the. No, no. I think you got there. the. I, got, I think you got the 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 uh, wrong oh, Larry really. Bubbles Brown. I don't yeah. know where they get their stats, but I was kind of in shock too. Yeah. Wait, wait somebody a that somebody like that could afford a higher standard of living. Wait a Larry Bubbles Brown. You got to be wrong. Net worth. Net worth. <laughs> worth. Okay, because there are other Larry Browns, you know. Yeah, but nobody Larry Bubbles Brown. Net worth. Okay, Larry Bubbles Brown. Net worth. Uh, let's see here. Uh, it says. No, it doesn't. Oh, his net worth estimated. Net worth, and it doesn't have anything listed here. I, well, I went to a couple. I might probably find it again. Well, no, but it may not be the same Larry Bubbles Brown. You know. How many other people use Bubbles as their middle name? Well, I, I don't know, but, you know. Uh, let me see here. Let me go back here. Let me see here. Larry Bubbles Brown. Uh, how old is there? How much is Larry Bubbles? Uh, no, how much is Larry David worth? <laughs> we don't want that one. <laughs> Let's see here. Larry David's net worth. No, I don't see any. Okay, Larry. it's it's called, the website is called wikitrusted.com. Yeah, so what? I'm looking, I put in here in Google, net it worth. Larry Bubbles Brown biography and talks about he's a comedian starting in San Francisco in the 80s, blah, yeah, blah, blah. Works. And you go down a little farther. Yeah. And, it's, and it says his net worth. Even farther, where to go? Let me see here. I have it here. Towards the bottom it says between one million and five million. Between one million and five million. Uh huh. Yeah, that's what it says here. But <laughs> th that's a big yeah. that's a big stretch. That's right. Between. I, I don't know them as well as you do. I think they don't know is what they don't know. Okay. Right. Let me see here. What, 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 <laughs> look up Alex Bennett's net worth. See, oh, millions. See, look, look, look at that. Now, I want to hear how much I'm worth according to them. Uh, Hold on. Uh, what, what? You got trouble, on with the show. Got trouble typing? What? 
Go on with the show. Go on with the show. <laughs> hey, John Larkin, how are you? Hey, how you doing? Um, Rooster Tea Feathers. What about it? What about still it? Still open. Well, it's it's closed um, because of the coronavirus, but it's still down there. Really? I mean, sunny. Yeah. Yeah. It. It's been there for like thirty-five years. Hmm. Have you find out how much I'm worth? I'm getting there. I, I found one that says, yeah, "But it's your husband," so that's not the same Alex Bennett. It says uh, one and a half million. Um, okay, I'll take that. Yeah, I'll, I hear you. Huh. Who was Alex Bennett? That's a good question. Um, I'll find it. Well, wait a minute. I, I can probably look up Alex Bennett's net worth. Well, that's what I put in here, and so there's all kinds of stuff. Well, how about that site that you got for Larry Bubbles Brown? How about those people? Hell, I don't know. I just well, you just put in my what... name. Just put in my name. Oh God, I got to go back to that. Hold on. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm making you work too hard. That's right. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, it doesn't know who you are. Nobody really does anymore. No. I used to be a big shot. Yeah. 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 What? He's having trouble finding it. Uh, here, Alex Bennett's net worth. Oh. Alex Bennett, age worth of, uh, 13 million. What? Composer. Yeah, what? <laughs> 13 Composer. Million. Not the same Alex Bennett, obviously. Yeah. Well, look. Just keep talking. I'll, I'll find the site again. No, you you won't. You won't find it. Here it is. You were born in 1939, right? That's right. Okay, now I got the right Alex Bennett. He's a, he's a journalist, Sagittarius. Wait, I'm a journalist. Yeah. I'm a journalist. That's what it claims. No, no. Uh, I'm a on BuzzLearn.com. Hmm. Well, Alex is listed as a successful journalist, born in the year 1939. He is ranked in the richest person in this list. Boy, they got the wrong Alex Bennett. I got to tell <laughs> you right now. Well, they got the age right, and they got your birthday right too. I know what it is. I don't know if you wanted out on the it was air. December eighteenth, nineteen thirty. Right, that's what it yeah. says. Yeah. Um, Rabana Sagittarius. Uh, put in Bennett Schwartzman. It's probably just an AI bot that goes and. Scrapes the internet for yeah. It says you're worth between one million and four million dollars. No, oh, really? Oh, I don't annual, have, I, uh, annual salary under review. Under review. Whatever the hell that means. Yeah. Try try uh, uh, social security. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, I love the fact. I am. That. I'm actually good at finding things on the internet. It's my days as a, as, a, as an investigator. Of course, it, it was, much, I, I thought the internet about, wasn't big then. I thought about, every now and then I, I think about moving back to California, right? Mm -hmm. and, doesn't say that here. Uh, no, no, I know doesn't say that there. Um, and um, so a friend of mine called me today, and she was from San Francisco, and uh, she was trying to get a hold of me, and she couldn't figure out how to get a hold of me. She figured out how to get a hold of me, and she got a hold of me too late to be able to see me while she was out here. But anyway, that's not the point. She lives in Felton, California. You know where Felton is? Sure. Yeah, it's on so the, the way to by, by Santa Cruz. By Santa yeah. Cruz. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I had a friend, uh, Karen Babbitt, whose father was Art Babbitt, the cartoonist for uh, Disney. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I believe I visited her once and that she lived in Felton. So I've, wow. been, I've been to Felton. But anyway, my, my friend lives up in the up in the mountains in Felton, above Felton or whatever, out in the redwoods. And she showed me a picture that one of her neighbors took a video with their they had like they have like you know cameras all over the place. And uh, so uh, 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 it, it, this woman, this person, took a picture you know with their security camera that was on, and they cut the video out. Of a mountain lion walking down their street, <laughs> and I finally decided. Well, I guess California is not for me. You know, not when not when a not when a, a mountain lion has a right of way over me. Who do we have here? I don't. Do I recognize the beard? I don't think I recognize you with the beard, or should I? 
uh, yeah, uh, uh, but it's Lenny. Lenny, Lenny is who he's talking to. Yeah. You might, Alex. It was uh, 20, 20 something years ago at Sirius it's when Sirius. I walked into your studio and you said, they just hired my, uh, my son, Howard Stern. <laughs> I was doing the classic rock stuff at Sirius. Oh. You were killing. You were killing it at the time, by the way, if really? I remember. Well, I like to think... You were w so wonderful on Sirius. Yeah, well, they... Yeah, I guess I w was... As long as Mel was there, I had a job. You know, because Mel appreciated talent. <laughs> and, and it so was on. Alex Unplugged. Yeah. Is and, how I looked at it. Yeah. It was, it, was, it, was a great, it was a great time. So, so fun, fun well, what was the la what's the last name? Uh, Block. B-L-O-C-H. Oh, of course. Of course, Lenny. I remember yes. you. It's so good to see you, my friend. Yes. And you're living where now? I'm living in Woodstock, New York. Yeah. About two two hours up the river. Yeah. And uh, doing radio here for the local uh, listener-driven radio. It's it's one of the last bastions of good radio in the country, <laughs> independently owned by one guy. Oh, wow. And, and uh, we get to, you know, we get to play around a lot. We get to... Uh, massage the music and kind of like the old days and there's a still a devout 50 plus listenership uh um, does the station and, make does the station make money station's making some money wow wow we're in a beautiful we just moved to a beautiful old methodist church on route 28 in west hurley new york and um you know woodstock is going through its own metamorphosis like a lot of uh a lot of towns um, yeah. of it, you know, a lot of towns like it, a lot of tourist towns. And um, there's a lot of money coming here and uh, mm. maybe too much, maybe too much. Mm -hmm. There's no place to rent. It's all B and B and all. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's, 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 it's a real uh, example of the have and have nots, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like a lot of tourist towns. And I'm lucky to have found a nice place and some great people to work for. And I'm, I'm doing radio. Uh, I do a remote radio show out in Arizona from my bedroom. Yeah, yeah. And I work at uh, I work at one of your old buddies. Didn't you know Levon Helm back in the day? No, I didn't. No. Levon, the drummer for the band. Right. I, I mean, got, I, I know the I know Levon Helm, and I of him. But he's I got never a, knew him. He's got an old studio. He passed away in 2012, yeah. but his studio is around the corner from my house. And I work there, and they do shows there, and I'm one of the uh, dozen or so old timers at park uh, park cars, and then do old man security at the at the barn for for shows. Oh, so geez, Almighty, yeah. It's you know, don't want to stop working. Like I love seeing you continuing to work. This well, is well, it's, great. It's, well, no, what this is, this is this is the end of a career right here. <laughs> You're watching it. You know? So be it. So, so be, be it. it. You know, I just I do it to keep my chops up is what I do so you know uh, and I'm, and I'm ha you know I've, I've been doing this for God I've been doing this for eight years now nine years or eight, how many years have we been doing eight years yeah. eight years eight years yeah yeah when nice. they dumped me from uh, Sirius XM uh, this is what I came and did the, uh, they dumped me on a I was gone on a Friday and I, on a Monday I was doing this so <laughs> you know that's what we call a segue. That's called a nice segue. <laughs> That's what's called you don't really want to give up the ghost. You know? <laughs> hey, I do work, uh, my boss in Arizona, I believe you either work with him or close by him in San Francisco, Dennis Constantine. Do you know that name? No. No. Dennis was at, he was at KFOG for a while and uh, was at Live 105. You were at Live 105. I was at Live 105, yeah. You, you were yeah. there. Yeah, I may be confusing my call letters, but uh, uh, he knows he knows of you and remembers you. Well, people fine. who worked in San Francisco know of me. You know, right. I mean, right. I, I I was not a small act in that town. You know? right. uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, well, gee, it's so good to see you, Lenny, because I remember and, I remember you with great fondness. You know, thank you. Yeah. Mutual. That's a mutual admiration society, indeed. Yeah. So, how long did you last at uh, at uh, at Sirius XM? Five years. Five years. Did, was I was I, there from 
I was there from 2000 to 2005, and I too got asked to leave by someone who didn't like my act. Yeah, 2004, I was gone. I think there. Right. No, I, mean, I was. I was there me, when, when, me, when when right. Howard walked in. I was. I was there when Howard walked into the building, you know, as the Messiah to save satellite radio. I'm saying 2014. And, excuse me. You were there. You were there until 14. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was I was long gone. I was uh, I was asked to leave in '05, um, again by someone who didn't care for my act, and rather than say, "Hey, we don't care for your act," they just trumped up some charges and uh, yeah, I was out the door. Yeah, you were out the door. Well, yeah, uh, it, it's good to see that you're still doing uh, doing music. It was I know it was something you really loved. You know, I forty five years of music radio. Yeah. I, I landed at, um, I was at CBS FM in the city for eight years. Right, right. I got to do uh, overnights. You know, I worked with Cousin Brucie and Ron Lundy and uh, Dan Ingram, I think, had moved on. But it was the last gasp of CBS FM before they turned to Jack yeah. and they went back to CBS FM. This is radio talk. I, I apologize to I, you I know. Other, we're, 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 who don't have the other insight that Alex and I have in regards to radio. Because but, I had uh, two, I had two. Uh, well, actually, three different careers. My first big career in New York was back in, uh, uh, I came here in uh, 1969, right? And wound up staying here till 70, and then I went out to California and worked San Francisco for 11 years and had another major success out there. And then I came back to Sirius XM. So there was a third. They're, they're like different people that know me from different places. They go, I used to listen to you, and I go, where? You know. <laughs> oh, but those were the days also when you could uh, you could establish yourself in many different markets as a different person. I mean, when I went to California, I reinvented mm -hmm. myself. I did, but, but today, everything's syndicated, so you only have one act, and that's the only one you can be remembered for. You know, right. So, right. whatever. So these guys, a lot of these guys here, remember me from San Francisco. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, Kevin remembers Absolutely. me, and uh, <clears throat> yep. In fact, most of I remember that. I remember the billboards and the signs on the side of the buses. I you used know, to go to the studio. And Cherry in Mike McGovern Street. Are, are like, you know, trying to fake fight. Wasn't it Cherry McGovern? Yeah, that was on the cover of Image magazine. Yeah. Yeah, I, I saw you all over the place and heard you on the radio. But too. that's when I used to be a big shot. There you go. You know, there's an old movie called The Roaring Twenties with Jimmy Cagney and Humphrey Bogart, and hum Humphrey Bogart shoots Jimmy Cagney. He goes out stumbling through the street, pat falls on the steps of what is I think supposed to be St. Patrick's Cathedral, and is dead and is dead in the arms of his girlfriend. And then a cop comes up, I think played by Ward Bond, who says, who was he? And she says whatever his name was in the picture. I can't remember uh, the name he used. And then she says, well, he says, what did, she, what did he do? And she looked back at the cop and said, he used to be a big shot. <laughs> and that, oh, yeah. always, no. that always resounded with me. Every time I got <laughs> fired from a radio station, I went, he used to be a big shot. You know. Uh, My mother would always say that to me. Really? Except differently, she would say, "You, you're acting like a big shot." You're acting like a big shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, as long as as long as we're dropping names, I don't mind dropping a few. Uh, my mom said something similar too. She would say um, to me, "You know, you're going to meet uh, uh, some of the people that are on their way up. Now you're going to meet them on the way down when you're going up." Yeah. And that yeah. was when I interned, and I told you this, Alex, many years ago. I interned for Wolfman Jack in New York City. Jesus Christ. At the age of 17, I was there in 73, 74. And uh, my mom would say that about him all the time. Don't worry, you're going to be on the way up when he's on the way down. And it kind of did happen like that. I think he passed in 95 and i was i've heard some bad things about him i have nothing but good things really? to tell you good good because i never i, re I really do never i mean I, he, he's a heavy pothead which turned me into a heavy pothead but i never saw him do coke and i went to a lot of parties with him mm -hmm. i never saw him even 
move on another woman. I know how much he was in love with his wife, Lou. So those are two constitutional mm -hmm. things that, you know, okay. that are in my heart nice about it. nice to hear. I, 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 saw, I, saw good, I saw mainly good in him. Yeah. Okay. Because I, 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 you know, I, there, uh, I've never, I never met the guy. Never met him once. You know, so I can't even say one way or the other. The first. I, I remember li listening mm -hmm. to him up to the time. I remember listening to him up to the time of his uh, of his death. Were those repeated syndicated shows, or did he just work up until the end? They're still running them, and I'm in touch with okay. his son. His son is Todd Smith. His son just emailed me the other day because we were going to hook up. I used to babysit his kids. So Todd was 12 years old, and uh, I'd take him to Walgreens. He'd steal stuff. Then he gets he gets caught, and he says, hey, I'm Wolfman Jack's son. The guy says, I don't care who the hell you are. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, no, those shows are still, I believe, in syndication. Really? They do the same thing with Dick Clark. They repurpose. They take his his voice and they drop it in over over <laughs> over songs and they repurpose and make new shows out of them. You know what and they can, you, these, know what, you know what they can do now? They can take my voice, your voice, Wolfman Jack's voice. <laughs> they can synthesize it and then they can have him do a whole new radio programs and it's his voice. Yeah. Wow. They have I, I noticed I was looking on uh, at a at a radio site, okay, the other day. And they have this woman who's an announcer and will be an announcer on your radio station virtually. You just buy her voice and then you can write the script and then it will just use her voice. But she won't be reading it or anything. It's just synthesizing her voice. Artificial intelligence. So the yeah. TikTok voice that all the kids use. Uh, it sounds like sort of like a Japanese woman, but you can put in any words, and it sounds like a regular person talking. Yeah, but this is this is literally that you can take almost any person now, and mm -hmm. and uh, take them, and I mean, for let's say they want to do a Humphrey Bogart digital movie, and they do a digital animation of him, and then they can take his voice and literally make it sound like Bogart because they're they're taking bits and pieces of the voice and stitching them together, and at an amazingly fast mm -hmm. time. Digitally. It's audio hologram. Is that what it's That's called? Incredible. I, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. I think I think they did they that. They do it with video. Why can't they do it with audio? Yep, absolutely. I, I want to say they did that with Jerry Garcia at one of the old Dead shows. That's they right. Up, they had him up on stage playing in a hologram form or in a big video oh, yeah, form. Yeah, And the fans yeah. jamming along with him. That's, yeah, that that's, was a few years ago. That's pretty yeah. weird. <laughs> well, have you ever seen that? Have you ever seen that uh, that fake video of Barack Obama giving a speech? Yes. Uh, yeah. It's hard to tell that that's fake. That's scary. Yeah. 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 So it's it's, it's real. Thumbs. It's real to a lot of people. They have a name. Yeah. They have a name for that. It's called deep fake. Yeah. yeah. Deep fake. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. Uh, they they could take uh, a person. And then they could take somebody's face, like Sylvester Stallone, and do a deep fake on the face of this person. It uh, it's it's really it's very yeah. They, didn't they do it on sixty Minutes or something? Yeah, yeah. PBS yeah. or something like that. They they did a a whole segment on that. And they and took they, they took the took guy the guy and literally cloned him. Well, they did, what they did is they took him. It was the who who's the. Uh, the black reporter. The black the guy. Show. I can't yeah. remember his name, but yeah, yeah, they did it on him. And they t no, but what they did, they didn't just do him. They did him thirty years ago. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. They went back thirty years, put a mustache on him, and the he whole just bit. Sat, sat there doing talking and everything like that, and they just put his old face on him. Yeah, I could sure use that about now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. There's a there's a guy on a pretty famous Instagram guy who, who has his whole channel is deep fakes of Tom Cruise. And yes, it's you can't tell <laughs> unless someone tells you you would never. The tell. only oh, thing, yeah, exactly. the, only, the only thing that's a dead giveaway is the Tom Cruise he's doing is younger than Tom Cruise is today. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and his body also looks like when he shows his whole. Body, oh, they showed they. I've seen the guy who does him, and then they yeah. just put the face on him. Yeah. of Tom Cruise. So, but he's just an amateur, you know, like at home on his on his Mac or something. 
<laughs> People are doing amazing things today. Jumps up on the couch just like he did with Oprah. Yeah. Yep. 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 What do you think about music today, Lenny? Boy, that is a loaded question. Um, <laughs> no, it's you not know, a loaded question. I, I, you know. I, I think, you know, and I said this 25 years ago at Sirius, too. I think there's still a lot of great music being made. You just have to seek it out. There's pretty much no more top 40. You yeah. know, there's no more top 40 radio that blends different styles together. I mean, you could look mm -hmm. at what the kids are listening to today and sound like our parents or like our grandparents. Oh, that's a lot of crap. Everything was great back when in my time. And there, you know, it, I think it's a fact that a lot of the best music was made in the 70s and 80s, but that's me being, you know, true to my own age. So I think there's still a lot of great music being made. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of garbage being made too. Um, the musicians don't have the avenues that they once had. Nobody's making money selling their music. It's all, you know, everything's digital. Everything's either being downloaded for free or, or you know, Spotify and the big companies are given, you know, very small amounts of money to, to well, the artists you know, for the music. But, but that's true with just about everything. I mean, people say to me, uh, don't you want to get back into radio? And I go, does it exist anymore? You know, maybe it exists for Lenny in, in, in Woodstock, but basically radio doesn't exist anymore. The people who are doing it... These big outfits that are doing it are are going digitally. They're doing you know right. the you know streaming things like that. That's the only way these these outfits are surviving. You know. Well, you know when when you see that some of the some of the radio companies are making money. You know they made uh, you know eight million in their last quarter. That's because they cut half of their staff. They yeah. continue to cut <laughs> and cut and cut the staff. My station actually. Uh, came up with a unique approach a couple of years ago. It's so, somewhat of a hybrid between a public radio station and a commercial radio station where we only do local advertisers, small local advertisers, and we ha it's listener supported. For a hundred bucks a year, you support the radio station, you help independent radio survive in the Hudson Valley, and um, you get plenty of perks for that. You get lots of free music. We, you know, give you a first shot at concert tickets. <clears throat> so it's a, it's a mm -hmm. hybrid between, and we 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 tell folks that you know we're only playing local commercials. We dropped a thirty thousand dollar McDonald's campaign because we wanted to stay with mainly local advertisers. Wow, that's great. So that's great. it yeah. it it we really was one of the first in the country to do oh, it. If gee, not I would first. I would do that with Gabnet, but I'd have to say for a hundred bucks, I'll blow you. You know, well, I mean, so be it. There's <laughs> too much you know, travel involved there. Are you, uh, <laughs> Lenny? Are you anywhere near the hotel Mount Mountain Brook? That does not ring a bell. No, the hotel in your neighborhood that a friend of mine used to work at, Hotel mm -hmm. Mountain Brook. Nope, don't know that. I know the Hotel Dillon. Um, Bob, this is a long. There. I had to look this up because they. Well, you were saying Levon Helm's old studio was that wasn't Big Pink, was it? That was not Big Pink. That's in Saugerties. This is a studio that he built in the middle of his um, uh, his uh, his depressed days when he wasn't making any money when he was going bankrupt. Yeah. So he built he built the studio that unfortunately burned to the ground. Oh. They rebuilt it, and it now. Uh, is a performance space and they have bands come in and, and do re, you know recording right. sessions for a couple of days mm. uh, but it's got a really it's funny <clears throat> we had Taj Mahal play there last week I wow. haven't seen Taj Mahal in 50 years 80 years old he was absolutely incredible <clears throat> magnificent charisma place was packed I've never seen more people walk out of that place with a big smile on their face then we get, you know, a couple of shows that get 100, 150 people. And then all these shows sell out, and I don't know who the bands are. I have to look them up on YouTube mm -hmm. to find out who they are. And that's where I'm, I'm getting back to, is there any good music today? There's plenty of it out there. It just doesn't get the exposure that it used to get. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, in, in the old days, the example I give is there's there's no more critical mass. In the mm -hmm. old days, in the, in the 70s and 80s, a new mm -hmm. Stones album came out. Hey, tonight at nine o'clock, WNEW is going to play the whole Stones record. Everyone was listening to NEW at nine o'clock to hear the Stones yep. album. Right. 
now you've got everyone splintered everywhere. They're on Facebook. They're on a podcast. They're on GabNet. They're on hmm. their sisters, you know, uh, microphone. There, there, there. There's just no critical mass anymore. I remember radio has lost that critical mass. I remember in 1999. <coughs> Uh, there was only one podcast in America, and I was doing it. <laughs> I was doing it. I, I could explain it to you, but if I explained it to you, you'd say, yes, of course, that was a podcast. I can I can riff off that. Yeah, For the 50th anniversary of Woodstock, I started something called Podstock from Woodstock. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I got Wavy Gravy, yeah. who was fantastic. Yeah. I got John Sebastian, who I just saw in the supermarket the other day, mm -hmm. who was a performer at Woodstock, great guy. Um, I got Yorma Kalkinen, who I interviewed in the green room at Levon's. And then after three episodes and a lot of work, I said, you know what? I'll put this up there with another, you know, five million other podcasts. And if I get five people listening to it, I'll be happy. Mm -hmm. It was too much, too much work. <coughs> no revenue, no real uh, noticeable source of revenue, and now everyone. There's, there's got to be five million. How did, well, I did. My question is, how do you do a podcast and get anybody to listen to you, unless you're doing some kind of mystery or something like that? You know? Right, right. Well, they, they, some of them do get a level of traction, but again, what is that level that's going to make it a success and make you a couple of bucks off? Well, I when I did it, I was the only one. And by the time by by last year, I what did I read? Something like 20, 20 million podcasts? Some some no ridiculous yeah. amount. You know. Alex, I want to get back to that. You know, how do you, is there any good music around today? I was talking about this on the air the other day. We're playing a new song by a guy named Steven Sanchez. Mm -hmm. It's a real throwback sounding song. Beautiful song. Guy has an incredible voice. I look him up. <laughs> just signed to a record label. He started out on TikTok. Wow. He got a huge following on TikTok. That's the way you do it. He's mm -hmm. 19 years. And I said, how do you make it in the music business these days? 19 years old on TikTok, huge following now. And, and, and I think a semi-major label deal. But the, the, the game has changed for everyone. You know, mm -hmm. musicians... They're making their money by touring and selling merchandise. You see them hawking their merchandise at all these shows now. Visit our merch table. Get a T-shirt. You know our new CD is available. Yeah, it, it's just it's you a gotta, different. You, gotta know a different how, you, you have to know how to play that. I, I <laughs> have not yet really learned how to play that game. You know, so I, I just do this. Yeah. So let me just check with the other people here. So uh, how are you doing, John? Out in San Francisco. Uh, I'm okay. I'm okay. Um, I, I, uh, I, I broke up. A, I, I hurt my leg because I broke up in a, a, a dog fight. This, I was just walking down the street and this, this pit bull ran after and it was attacking this other dog that I wasn't my dog. I was just w walking next to it. And this, and th this uh, pit bull was going to kill the dog. So there was like four of us trying to break it up and I was kicking the dog, kicking it and kicking it. And then some guy from a construction site shows up with a big four by four, and he goes whack right on right on the pit bull's head, and and, and pretty much broke its back. But oh, wow. but the other dog had a big gash in its side, wow. and it was going to be killed. It was sad. And then the next morning I woke up, and uh, I'm fucked up. I can't. I can barely walk because you know I'm too <laughs> old. Kicking dogs. <laughs> Why? I mean, that's that's something. I I've heard about breaking up beer, you know, bar fights, but not dog fights. Yeah. Oh, this 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 pit bull had a head like that. Well, pit know? bulls have have uh, have literally vice like jaws. I mean, oh, they're, I know. they're just yeah. You know, the best way to stop a pit bull is with a gun. Yeah. 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 They're very hard to stop. They're very hard. To absolutely. Stop. Well, this yeah. guy with the four four, four by four definitely. Uh, I think it broke its neck because oh, wow. it couldn't walk after that, and it was oh, pretty sad. Thing. A yeah, friend of mine, his pit bull, his pit bull grabbed his his friend's mother's leg with his jaw, and uh, wouldn't let go. And they had they called the police, and the police came and shot the dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it was. Uh, they're, they're, you know, 
you, you know, it's it's not the dog's fault. It's the the people that raise that the dogs. Raise them. You know? Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, because I've heard that pit bulls can also be the sweetest dogs around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're oh, great yeah. dogs. Yeah. They're great. Well, uh, some of them are bred poorly. Some of them are bred. Uh, you know, they breed them with the mean ones on purpose for fighting, fighting dogs. dogs. That's yeah. fighting and dogs. then, and then, if you end up with one of those, you really got to know what you're is, doing is because the, they can snap. Is, is that the excuse for why Trump turned out the way he did? <laughs> Yeah, bad breeding. Mm-hmm. Boy, have you been yeah. reading about all, uh, today? Merrick Garland finally had to get up and say, "Hey, look, you know, stop yeah. it already. You know, you guys are getting <laughs> ridiculous." Uh, hey, you but, know, the uh, police don't turn over information until it's time. You know, but all the Republicans are out there saying, "We demand to know why you raided the house," and we demand. Okay, well, you know, you know who they can get the information from. Oh. oh. Donald Trump, absolutely. Because Donald Trump has the right, it got all the information, what it said in the warrant, what was taken from the House, a whole list and all of that. All he has to do is tell his Republican cohorts, here's the warrant, here's the information, I've got it. Mm -hmm. He can can let, let it out if he wants to. He but, could actually have it published if he wanted. And they're sitting around yelling, oh, we want this information. Well, just ask ask, uh, ask Donald. Well, Gar- yeah. Garland called their bluff. He's going to release it. Well, he, no, he can't release it unless Trump says it's okay to release it. And they're going to fight right. that. Real and they're going to fight that. I don't know what the Republicans are going to say now about, oh, well, we want to see this information. Yeah, that's well, he has the right not to release it if he doesn't want I think, to. I think Trump's going to claim they stole his gold, solid gold toilet too. Yeah, <laughs> I, I already heard they're, they're 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 saying you know the FBI planted yeah, stuff. Yeah, in, yeah, yeah. Of course. Right. So, of course. And, yeah, Lindsey Graham said that. Believe that? No, well, that, with Trump, that, you don't Graham. have to plant anything. That's the reason that Merrick Garland stood up for the FBI today because those allegations, you know, oh, they probably planted stuff. What? You know. Yeah, right. And they're, they're also uh, saying it's nuclear classified documents. I mean, shit. Harry. If, he, if he was stealing that shit, that's like like what the Rosenbergs got uh, got um, oh, yeah. executed for. Well, However, David Brooks had a great piece in the Times today uh, titled, um, Did the FBI Just Hand Donald the Presidency Again? Because it, oh, wow. it, it's almost like it's martyrdom. They they're gonna they're gonna turn him into a martyr, you know. And yeah, uh, yeah. I'm not I'm not thrilled. <laughs> I'm not thrilled. Well, right. we have to see how it's here. His people vote. His people vote. They get out and they vote. Yeah, they do vote. But then again, so do we. Yep. Yeah. You know. Yeah. That's we're true. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, no. Well, I mean, if he gets reelected, that's the end of democracy in America. You know, yeah. that's the end of America as we know it. But then again, I don't know about you. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how old you are now, uh, Lenny. But um, uh, sixty-six. Sixty-six. Well, at my age, 80, eighty-two. Uh, I keep saying this is not the country I signed up for. You know, this is not the country I was promised when I was taught at school what America was all about. You know. So I mean. It's uh, it's not the same. It's just not the same. They rip Van Winkle. Do you know where that is, uh, Lenny? Um, it's in I Woodstock. There's Lake a brewery. Rip Van Winkle. There's, there's, there's the a brewery. In Woodstock. That's where that hotel's at. Well, there's a, there, Why know do there's you keep brewery. bringing up this hotel nobody heard of? <laughs> There's a brewery <laughs> called the Rip Van Winkle, that I know. Well, up yeah. there, Rip Van Winkle, the old tale about Rip Van Winkle and even the okay. cat skills and uh, right. fell asleep or what. I can't remember the story now. It, it's a it's a campground in Saugerties, which is the, the next town over. So if okay. that's where they're staying. Yeah, they're cabins. Yeah. It's a quaint old 160-acre campground in the Catskills in Hudson Valley. <laughs> well, the funny part it, it, about uh, Woodstock, the funny part about Woodstock, and it becoming very famous, it became famous for the Woodstock Festival, which wasn't held in Woodstock. No, it wasn't. Held it was in, supposed uh, to be held in Woodstock, but Woodstock wouldn't let them, so they moved it to Bethel. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And that's where it was held. 
Well, they first moved it to Wallkill because, yeah, the town, the townspeople here did not want to have it. Right. So Michael Lang got a place in Wallkill, which is a little bit closer. Yeah. And they built they built the stage. And then with two weeks to go, the town of Wallkill said, we don't want 50,000 hippies here. So Michael gets a helicopter. He's another guy I used to see at the at the local grocery <laughs> store. Big smile, big Jufro, the same. He looked the same as he did 50 years ago. Jufro, I love that term. Yeah. And he uh, flies. He fly, I can say that because I don't have one. And he flies over, um, you know, Yazgur's farm and says, oh, look at that. That's perfect. And he gives Max 10 grand. And Max says, sure, you can do it here. And they had to, with the two weeks to go, they had to, had to build another stage and build all the fences. Two days to go, and the workers say to Mike, Michael, you're freezing on us. Oh, boy. freezing. Well, and Michael, says, without a stage, we don't have a show. Without a stage, you don't That's, have a show. Yeah, yeah I I was at Woodstock. I I literally was uh, backstage at Woodstock. Wow. Mm. wow. And I I left early. <laughs> Be, well, because I had, you ran out of dope. No, I had a radio show. <laughs> no, I had a radio show on Saturday night that I had to do, and I couldn't get the. Here's here's a great story. I uh, I knew Michael Lang, and I said to Michael yeah. when he did my radio show and was talking about this festival he was going to hold in Woodstock. Hey, if I could get a, would you allow me to put a telephone line in there? So I could do my live show on Saturday night from the Woodstock Festival, and he said, "Sure, if you want to, we'll uh, we'll 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 work it out with you to get a get a line up there." Because those days you used to have to run a phone line in. There was, you know, today you just get on the phone, um, and uh, so I go to my bosses and I said, "I have the ability." to put a line into the Woodstock Festival and do a show from up there. Can we do it? And it wasn't that expensive to do. I mean, it wasn't cheap, but it wasn't expensive either. And they said, eh, what's the, what's the Woodstock Festival gonna be? If they had had a phone line in there, do you know how much money they could have made off of that? Because that whole thing could have been turned into covering the concert, the whole thing. Oh yeah, and instead, uh, I had to leave early, and I went back with Paul Krasner because he had a date, and uh, we 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 left. I think uh, uh, what uh, Friday night we left, but we were I think there. Saturdays obviously. when the best dope came out. You missed it all. Well, no, that's when the mud started happening. I'm sorry. I did. I'm glad I didn't stick around. Okay, you know. Yeah. But uh, that's a, I, I just remember how that the stupidest decision any radio station I ever worked for made. Yes, uh, uh, John. Did you see the documentary on Netflix about Woodstock '99? Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> what, what a fucking mess that was! <laughs> oh, and I'll tell you that's probably had a lot to do uh, with why the fiftieth one that Michael tried to do three years ago did not happen. And I was sort of involved with that. I was gonna do a podcast with him. Um, and um, if you see the interview, if you don't wanna watch the whole thing, I urge you to go to YouTube, put in Michael Lang, Woodstock 99. You'll see an interview that he did in, uh, I think November of 19. Uh, it was three months before he died. And the goal, the the Jew fro is pretty much gone, and he pretty much says, "Yeah, you know, you get a couple of assholes out there, and that's and that's what happened at Woodstock '99." Well, you know, it. it I, no, I, it I, wasn't I, a couple of assholes. It was about a hundred thousand assholes. You know? it, yeah, it, it was probably more than a couple. The you're problem right. is, you just can't go back. You know, right. and and yeah. it, Woodstock. You know, the reason Woodstock was so memorable is it was a complete fuck up. And nothing, yeah. nothing that yeah. could go right went right. Okay, everything went wrong. Uh, it was incredible, uh, and and because of that, it became memorable. Well, the, also there was a sense of peace and calm throughout most of the original festival. By the way, this coming weekend is the fifty-third anniversary. 
it was the 12th 13th so, 14th so didn't they out here in Altamont up by out by oh the forget that crazy try and reduplicate it or something like that yeah that was they the were, rolling did, did you see right. the movie did you see the movie yeah, yeah, yeah. I did a long time okay. ago, but they their mistake was they hired the Hell's Angels yeah. for security. Yeah. Yeah. For security. And you know who uh, Michael Lang and the Woodstock people hired for security? Who? They hired Wavy Gravy and the Hog Farmers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really? I, wow. As Wavy says, they became the Peace Patrol. The peace let me tell you, let me tell oh, you yeah. a great, wow. the great rape, Wavy Gravy story. Hugh Romney was his real name. Uh, I was doing a what I, uh, I was doing a, uh, uh, what do you call it, a, uh, a telethon in San Francisco. And they had Hugh Romney there. And he was in his wavy gravy best, you know, with the clown outfit on and everything. And I'm reading the teleprompter. And the teleprompter is talking about how this is a different kind of, of telethon. We've upgraded telethons. We're modernizing telethons. And then I point to Wavy Gravy and I read the telethon, uh, the, te the teleprompter, and it says, and this is the new face of telethons. And here's <laughs> Wavy dressed in his clown outfit. And I go, Big well, red nose. and then I looked and I went, well, not exactly that face. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Is he still alive? Yeah. He 80, is. 80, is he, is, is he 80, really? 80. Yeah, and still very much involved in something called the Seva Foundation, which um, oh, that's right, yeah. pr uh, provides um, sight for a hundred thousand blind people worldwide. Yeah. He's, he's still very, uh, very much involved. Wavy was one of the singly sweetest people I ever knew. I, I met him out here at the uh, Santa Cruz Blues Festival a few times. Yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, he had the hog farm. Yeah, and uh, they got me high on more than one occasion, you know. <laughs> Just get around him and get high. Well, no. What happened was we there was a thing uh, that was held up in Vermont, and it was called the uh, uh, the progress, what the underground uh, uh, press or whatever uh, conference. Uh, the what was it called? The uh, it, oh, oh boy. He, well, anyway, it was a pre it was a conference for all the underground press, and we all met at this school up in uh, up in Vermont. I'm trying to remember the name of it now. It's a very famous school that is a kind of an advanced school where people get you know get degrees in walking through the woods and things like that. You know, <laughs> and 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 uh, he, they were in the morning. They had two vats of orange juice. One said regular on it, and one said electric. And if you took the electric, you were on acid for the rest of the day. And if you yeah. took regular, you had a nice glow from orange juice, you know. But they were always at those things passing out, let's say, spike. Electric. Electric, yeah. yeah. Electric. Uh, and they were, they were a wonderful group of people. You know. The trouble with acid and orange juice is you got to know how many drinks to take. You know, what's the dose? You know, do you have one cup? Do you have two cups? You can't overdose on, you couldn't overdose on acid because there was no lethal dose of acid. Yeah. It, it, your body would only absorb so much. And yeah, but the trip can the trip can end up not being so much fun. Oh no! I mean, you're always people taking, also, you're always people also know what they were doing. They would just take one nice drink of it and walk yeah. away. Right. Yeah. Right. Then go to the other one for the rest of the day. Yeah. Right. right. Exactly. We have another wonderful local here in Woodstock. She's actually a dentist. Her name is, I know her last name, uh, Rona, Rona, Owsley. Owsley. She was married. He wasn't, married, wasn't married to Stanley. They had a child together, and I guess they're common law because they were together for twenty years. But Rona, he, don't tell me he's one, still alive. No, he was. He died like in. He was in Augusta. Austria. Stanley Owsley was the guy who literally made LSD, or you know, he didn't he, invent it, but he made it in batches. Yeah, he was, wasn't, wasn't yeah. he connected to the CIA too, or no, something? No. Uh, I thought he, he, also, was a, he also did sound for the dead early on. He was like their sound guy, known as Bear. 
Bear, yeah. Yeah, well, oh, that he, was Owsley? yeah he would uh, he would go out and uh, he would do uh, he would do LSD for the Grateful Dead. Uh, did it for Kesey's uh, what do you call it? Kesey's um, the electric Kool Aid acid e- test thing. Electric Kool Aid yeah. acid uh, test. Yeah. Very pranksters or something. Yeah. Very oh, yeah. prank. Yeah. But it I was have a, further. I have a funny story. In, in my senior prom at my high school, my best friend was the drug king, and he spiked the punch bowl without most people knowing with uh, LSD. Oh, well, see, that's I, wrong to do. I and, agree. The, and the teachers were high on it and everything. And so the newspaper article, which I have somewhere around here, says, you know, they interview people at the, at the senior proms and take pictures. Three girls were freaking out. They were they swore they were being chased by giant Easter eggs. Hmm. That was good acid. <laughs> well, you know, when I was at the Progressive Media Conference, uh, again, uh, when they were passing out the acid, I took some of their acid, and that night I was still high, and I'm walking through the woods, and all of a sudden I see these lights swirling around my legs and around my body, and I went, wow, these guys are doing the coolest light show I've ever seen in my life. Well, I'm a kid from the city, and I just had never seen a lightning bug before. But these were swarms of lightning bugs that I was seeing uh-huh. while I was high on acid, and I, there was nobody there to tell me, no, those are really lightning bugs, you know. I, I had a friend of mine that got high on acid. He was sitting in a room with one plant hanging on the wall, and he said, come in here quick. There's a wandering Jew after me. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and I came in there, and the plant was a wandering Jew, but it was growing exponentially in his head and i'm like ray how, how many how many people here have done acid <laughs> are we well, admitting uh, uh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, three, three, four <laughs> okay i've never done it so i just oh well I'll, I'll get you some right away ray you, you'll be really good on it i had some i threw it out well i would try i, I would try mushrooms before Acid. Yeah. Yeah, I want to try shrooms. Yeah. Yeah. There he is. You make okay. mushroom tea. There's wavy. Oh, there's yeah. the. Oh, wavy gravy. Yeah. yeah. That was uh, 2013. Yeah. Uh, hey, here's a fun fact about LSD that I just learned. Uh, I'm new to this uh, program they call AA, and I'm actually really enjoying it. And there's a uh, a documentary on Bill W. That is also highly recommended. He was really quite quite an uh, interesting guy, and very much like Jerry Garcia, because he started this whole program and then became the center of attention, and then said, "No, I don't want to be the center of attention." However, he he tried acid later in his career to try and find an answer, and he was doing acid for like five years when it was still legal. So that was probably early sixties. But you don't hear that about, you know, the king of no drinking, that yeah. he actually experimented with LSD for a good... Well, I, I can see where that would be consistent with his beliefs, however, because some people thought that that might be an answer to alcoholism. Yeah, yeah no, they, it was de- definitely studied. Absolutely. The one thing about LSD that was amazing is, is that it was a shortcut to psychiatry. In other words, you could take a, have a good session with a good psychiatrist on LSD and perhaps cut through most of the problems that would take you years and years of psychoanalysis. Well, but they're, they're trying to do that again. To, they're going back to it now. Yeah. Yeah. They, they yeah. do it with ketamine. Yeah. They're making it legal. In the proper yeah. hands, in the proper hands, it could be used as a very useful tool. They're yeah. using psilocybin now. Right. Ketamine. Well, psilocybin, psilocybin they're using for something slightly different. My wife, Ronnie. Uh, died a few years ago and while she was in the process of the throes of dying she went through a psilocybin right thing right where right. It, it it made her lose her fear of death right it's yeah. being used for people they're who are also using Ill. Uh, small doses of LSD mm-hmm. and psilocybin and uh, is it not peyote? Maybe I, right. I, I think for peyote. anxiety and depression, right, Kevin? Ketamine. They're using well, ketamine. The Any doctor. Yeah. Therapy. Controlled, yeah, you they, know, controlled doses and therapy. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah, 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 yes, Ketamine's Tony. a tranquilizer, Here's right? Tony who was... No, a, it's well, also a hallucinogen, and they're using it for that because it's the only one that's legal. Yeah, yeah. The other things, they have to do special studies to do it, but yeah. ketamine, they can just do it. Uh, but it's not... Yeah. It, yeah. Tony raised his hand, and Tony is uh, the highest thing he's ever gotten high on is aspirin. Go ahead, Tony. That's true. <laughs> when my father was home, uh, he, was, he was like running, he was home to pass away. They gave him that drug, Alex. That's Psilocybin? Yeah, he was actually hallucinating, seeing things. Yeah. When, oh, yeah he yeah. says, I see, a ba- I, see a, I see a baby in the corner. There's that. There's no, like, he was seeing different images of people. What, yeah, there's a lot of Ronnie, drugs. That, Ronnie yeah. did it. She did it with somebody who charged her, I think, five thousand dollars for the session. But it, the person stayed with her for about a full day oh, while wow. she was on yeah. it, and went through it with her, and and very creatively led her through the uh, through the si- situation. If you're right. talking about Tony is probably a reaction because my dad had the same thing when he was in the yeah, hospital. Yeah, he kept seeing things. He saw like yeah. a little baby. He was talking about see that? He says, no. army tanks outside the fifth floor of the hospital. Yeah, he kept seeing little like little kids and yeah. he, was, he was very he was very peaceful that, with it. That's that's a drug reaction though. Yeah. From something they gave him. Yeah, yeah well, that's well, that's not that's not acid. Lenny's that's looking fun. a little shocked about something. What were you gonna say, Lenny? No, I was I have friends who swear by microdosing of psilocybin. They grow their own mushrooms, mm-hmm. and it help. It, they claim, and I've seen some studies that say it claim it, it can help with severe depression. Yeah, and, sure. and you know there are medicinal uses for it that probably the drug companies don't want to hear about because oh, it well, takes sure. profits. Well, 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 also, <laughs> also, psychiatry didn't want to hear about LSD cutting down on the number of sessions you had to have with a psychiatrist. <laughs> hey, hey, Lenny, how can we hear you on, on, on the internet? We're, uh, we're on the iHeart Radio app. We're not a okay. part of iHeart, but uh, Radio Woodstock, WDST, is yeah. on the iHeart Radio app. I'm on uh, weekends, and I do all the fill-in mm-hmm. work, and then I'm on a station in Arizona, and this uh, show, by the way, is on iHeart as well. This show. Right. Oh, yeah. fantastic. Yeah. You know so why? That was my podcast. Because they want quality. They want quality. And that's why they're probably choosing you, Alex. That's probably why. But, but, and then Ray has no. a podcast, and it's on iHeart. Fantastic. Okay. Um, but it's on the Radio Woodstock is on the iHeart app. We're in the Hudson Valley at one. I, I remember the beginning of iHeart with podcasting. Then, then we got to get going here. But uh, I heart with the beginning of podcasting. When I first wanted to put my podcast up, they said, "Are you good enough for us? How many viewers, listeners do you have? What blah blah blah?" They had this whole whole list of things you had to answer. By the time I finally got on, they said, "Do you have a pulse?" Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's what happened with me. Yeah. Now, anybody, Lenny, we can hear you on iHeart. Is what you're saying? iHeart Radio, iHeart the app. It's uh, WDST or Radio Woodstock, and then. There's a station in Arizona, KVNA, Arizona's Adult Alternative. That's on uh, TuneIn. Yeah. The adult um, alternative I think of is Trump. Yeah, okay. <laughs> anyway. Hey, listen, thank you so much, Lenny. Come Thanks, back and Lenny. see us again. Just join yeah. us some at I, night whenever you I, want to. Wonderful, Alex. Such, such a great time to reconnect with you and to yeah. see all your well, beautiful things. Come, come back you. again. We'd like thank to see you, you again. <laughs> I think pleasure. everybody here. Yeah, agrees come on back. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Jeff. We appreciate it. We appreciate uh, your uh, 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 being here, Alan. Uh, hey, uh, uh, we want to thank our good friend John Larkin in San Francisco. Kevin, thank you so much. Of course, Lenny, thank you. Thank you to Ray Renati, and uh, thank you to Tony Magno. Everybody. Give a big wave goodbye, and I'll give a big wave goodbye at you. Okay? All righty? Okay. And there they go, folks. Okay. I had to figure out what I had to do next here. And uh, thank you uh, for being here, everybody. Uh, no Jack tonight. Jack's still out because Jack is still, you know, got problems. But he's getting better, and he'll be back in about a week, we hope. Uh, in the meantime... We'll see you again tomorrow for our last show of the week. And by the way, tomorrow night, uh, the first hour of the show will be an interview with the former governor of the state of New York, David Patterson. Uh, And it's a very good interview, so I hope you'll be listening for it. And then after that, we'll take about a half hour worth of calls. Uh, And in the meantime, as always, if you see her, 
tell her I love her, okay? Good night, everybody. <laughs>